G'day guys, how are you going? Now today we are reviewing the 2020 Toyota Supra here in sunny Australia. And of course, we will be doing a full in-depth review of it. But is the Toyota Supra just a BMW Z4? And will the 2021 Toyota Supra that will be coming out in around about six months time make the 2020 Supra completely redundant? Well, today we're gonna find out. Definitely subscribe to the channel as well so you can see when I do upload the 2021 Supra review and other cool upcoming car reviews here on Matt Brand Cars. Now, as always, we're gonna start by taking a look at the exterior of the Toyota Supra. Then we're gonna move on to the interior and see how it drives. And finally, we're gonna end on, is it worth buying? Make sure as well, if you do enjoy the video, go down there and hit the thumbs up button. It of course really helps the channel out. Now, I'm gonna start off by giving a full disclaimer. This this is my third Toyota Supra in two weeks, and it has an issue with the differential. The first Toyota Supra I had had some sort of drivetrain malfunction. It just limited power, but it said drivetrain malfunction. And because the warning lights in this car are turning off and on, and you hear the classic BMW warning chime, you might hear that during today's video. And we will be discussing these issues during the video, so make sure you watch till the end. Also, you're going to be seeing two cars in this review because I've been filming in the yellow banana colored Supra, nitro yellow, and also this beautiful Nurburg matte grey Supra I'm in now. Anyway, let's just start. Beautiful sound. Oh my God. Now I'm just gonna say it, this is the most beautiful car I have ever driven. And if we start with the front, holy fucking shit is it beautiful. Okay, let's start with the headlights. The headlights are absolutely gorgeous. Look how long and bright the LED daytime running light is that also acts as the turn signal indicator. It's so sharp and so sleek. The daytime running light is really a piece of art. And then just behind it are the three projector beams that make up the headlights. And they're super bright. And again, they just look so mean, so cool, so menacing. I love it. Seriously beautiful headlights. Of course, below the headlights are the three-way split grills, which is just a thing of beauty and super pretty. Now, keep in mind, a lot of the grill is fake. To me, I don't really care. I think that it's still absolutely gorgeous. And it really stays true to the FT1 concept that the Supra is based on. If you compare the fronts of both, they look very, very similar, which is great. The Range Rover Evoque, when it first came out, did so well because it was almost identical to its concept car. And the same can be said for the Toyota Supra. Oh, and there are also little front splitter spoilers down there, which maybe help with the aerodynamics. They're probably there for styling and they look pretty cool. And then there is just the overall shape of the front, the long elongated nose, which is just like a giant, beautiful bubble. Yet it's really low, slammed down on the wheels and really looks like it just came off a racetrack. I don't know if you can tell, but I am absolutely in love with the looks of the Supra. Oh, and one other thing, the double bubble roof, in case you want to put your helmet on and sit in here. It's a cool look. It's so cool. Okay, the side. You guessed it. It's pretty damn stunning. My favorite part of the side by far are the giant fender flares that you can stick a GoPro on and get really cool shots just like this. When you're looking side on, it's just huge and bulbous and really helps to give it the wide stance look, yet narrow cockpit. Kind of like what you'd find on a Formula One racing car. Of course, they don't have fenders, but you get the wide to narrow look thing. And the car is very wide. The rear tires are 275 millimeters wide and the front tires are 250 millimeters wide. These are wide tires for a lot of grip, and we will be getting into the driving very shortly. When looking at the side of the car as well, you get to see the 19 inch forged alloy wheels, which are on the GTS version of the Toyota Supra here in Australia, and they look beautiful. Sorry, just a brief interruption here so I can floor it. Oh my God. Okay, I gotta compose myself. But yes, the 19 inch wheels, they're beautiful, they're gorgeous. The red brake calipers as well are upgraded on the GTS model and they look really good, but I have not been able to notice the braking difference between these ones and the ones you get on the GT model. Maybe on a racetrack you would. One weird thing though is that there is a very oddly placed vent on the door. And if you pulled it off, seriously, where would that cool? Would that cool the door? I guess it looks really cool, but really you're not fooling many people. Or maybe you are. 
I don't know. And of course, we have to discuss the duck lip spoiler that you can see protruding out the back. It's just a really beautiful look. It's not something you see on very many cars, and Toyota have done a really great job in putting it on the Supra. I think it suits the car so well. Speaking of the back and the rear of the Supra, keeps the old Supra font. It's just a really nice way to pay homage to the old Toyota Supra. Even if you don't think that the badge belongs there, I think it still suits the overall styling of the car. The rear taillights are relatively aggressive looking, but they're not the coolest taillights I've seen on the back of a car, but that's more of a personal preference and they still look pretty cool. I am loving what they did with the reverse lights though, because they've put it into where a rain light would be in a race. So when you put the car into reverse, it puts up a really cool reverse light out the back like you should be seeing in a race. And then we have the dual exhausts. Yes, they are real and they sound beautiful. Here's a short compilation. Overall, I really like the looks of the Toyota Supra. Yes, there are a lot of fake vents on it, although Toyota have said you can pull off those vents and make it into real aero, whether that's true or not, considering the door one is just complete bull. I don't know, but it's voluptuous, it's sleek, it's so eye-catching, especially in this Nürbur gray matte paint or in the banana nitro yellow you can get, or really any color, they all look good. I'm a huge fan of the looks of the Toyota Supra. Well, let's get under the shell and into the interior. I wanna start with what's not so great with the interior, and first and foremost is this infotainment display. The Toyota Supra uses parts out of the old BMW parts bin, and this infotainment display is straight out of a BMW i3. It is very small. It's functional enough. It uses the previous generation iDrive, but it's very dim, quite hard to see in bright daylight. And also, it has no Android Auto, which is absolutely ridiculous. As I said in my Mini Cooper review, which you can click up there, it is unacceptable in 2020 to not have Android Auto. And for Android users like me, it cripples the car because the BMW maps are very average. Then there are the overall ergonomics. Now I'm five foot 11, I'm a pretty standard height and I am too close to the pedals. As a result, I feel really cramped in the seat and although I haven't done a few hours of journeys in this car, I can only imagine it wouldn't be a very comfortable affair. Also, my knee is resting on the center console and it's not because I'm doing it to be comfortable, I can't put my knee anywhere else. It just naturally sits there where my foot is on the dead pedal. As a result, keep knocking it. The pain in the bum. It feels really awkward. I'm so not a fan of that. Visibility is also really, really poor. Now that is a bit more nitpicky. It's not a deal breaker for me at all. But Woo! what kind of is a deal breaker is that when you put down the windows, there is the most awful noise of buffeting when you're above 60 kilometers an hour. But let's talk about the good. First of all, fit and finish in here is absolutely great. Soft plastics are everywhere. It isn't as good as a BMW interior would be. So you can see that they have cut costs, but it's not unpleasant at all. And it feels really nice. Probably my favorite touch on the interior is the carbon fiber in the center console. I'm not even sure if it's real. It certainly looks real. And it's just a really nice sporty touch. And the digital display cluster as well is absolutely fantastic. It is everything I would ever want from a sports car display. Now again, this is pulled out of the BMW i3 parts bin, but it's fantastic. They have put the center tack kind of plastic there, but it helps. All I have ever wanted was to see the tack in the center, the digital speed readout on this side, and other information like adaptive cruise control, things like that. All of that is here. So I'm a huge fan of how Toyota have implemented the digital gauges. And there is the heads up display as well. It is the BMW heads up display because the Toyota heads up display is god awful. And you can see that in my Toyota Camry review. It's very bright. It shows you all your information up there and it will show you your navigation as well. Then there are these seats. Now these ones I'm sitting on are the optional Alcantara seats and they are absolutely lovely, but you can't get them at the moment. 
and they're out of stock for their foreseeable future, potentially forever. So instead, let's take a look at the one in the yellow banana, the leather seats that were in there. They are absolutely fantastic. They are soft, they are comfortable. I have zero complaints. Well, except for the weird ergonomics where I can't put the seat back very far, but I suppose you have to live with that if you own a sports car. And then there is the steering wheel. And for all my long time subscribers out there, you know how much I care about my steering wheel. And this steering wheel is pretty good. It honestly reminds me of the BMW X1 steering wheel, which I reviewed, and you can click up there to watch that one. Functionally, it is absolutely fine. In fact, it's pretty good. You have your cruise control on your left and your media on the right, and that's a great layout. It works really well. It's got relatively good paddle shifters that are metal look on the front, but when you actually touch them are plastic, so that's a bit of a disappointment. It's just nothing really special about it. It doesn't feel particularly great in the hands. Yes, it is leather, but it's not like a really sporty steering wheel. It's just okay. Quickly talking about the boot space. Now the Supra is a lift back and it's actually surprisingly practical. There is a weird cutout for the boot. So getting some larger stuff in there might be more difficult, but it has plenty of space back there. You could easily take the car on a weekend getaway, which is honestly more than you could ask for. And I do have to give a special mention to the two speakers back there. They do look really, really cool and help to give it that 90s vibe. Big fan of that. So let's get on to the part that we've probably all been waiting for how it drives. Now the Toyota Supra has an inline six cylinder with a twin scroll turbo on it, producing 250 kilowatt of power, 500 newton meters of torque, although we know that actually it is more than that and Toyota have fudged the numbers a bit. All of this is driven to the rear wheels by an eight speed ZF transmission. And yes, there is no manual option. And yes, that is a shame. But get this, it has a claimed fuel use, a combined claimed fuel use of 7.1 liters per 100 kilometers. But somehow I feel like it's probably more than that. It is so fucking fast. My God, it's fast. I have chills. Now, I don't have to tell you this, the car is blisteringly fast. It has a claimed zero to 60 miles per hour time of 4.4 seconds, but really it is closer to 3.8 seconds. And the new one that's coming out will have 380 horsepower, which is a 50 horsepower bump. And that has a claimed zero to 60 time of 3.8 seconds. We can only imagine it will be closer to 3.4 seconds. Again, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you can see when that review comes out. And here is a pretty amazing stat. It has a 100 millimeter shorter wheelbase than the Toyota 86, and it is 90 millimeters wider. Isn't that just unbelievable? Like genuinely shocking. And it's no surprise, the way this car handles is just next level. As I said, it's rear wheel drive, but holy crap, it feels like a all-wheel drive. 250s on the front, 275s on the rear. The tire tracks are massive and you get so much stability. Handling, as you would expect, is super tight. I feel like I could turn this car on a quarter. Now the Supra has two driving modes. It has normal and it has sport individual. So you can configure it how you like, how you want the engine, suspension, handling, and transmission. Truly all you could ever want from a sport button. You don't have five different modes. Just two, normal or really fucking fast. Oh, it's really fast. It's fast. You know, even in the sport individual mode, Ride quality has been absolutely superb. As I said, handling is just incredible. It is so much more than just a sports car in a straight line. I really feel like if you took this to the track, you would be able to perform really, really well. It is a really good sports car in every aspect. Overall, the experience has been absolutely awesome and the way it drives, I have zero complaints. Now let's get on to, is it worth it? I wanna start by addressing the elephant in the room. This is the third Supra I have had in two weeks because two of them have had a drivetrain malfunction of some sort. Now the caveat here is that the Supras you get as press units are just that, they are press units. So if you look up Toyota Supra Review Australia, for instance, and you have a look at the Toyota Supra, you will see a lot of the Supras have the same number plate as this one, T-O-Y-G-R-4. This car, for instance, was at the press launch in Australia back last year where they took them to the track. It has done 8,550 kilometers pretty much entirely of which has been with motoring journalists who, like me, thrashed the car around. Now, 
I'm not making excuses here. I really wouldn't expect this to happen in a Toyota, but we know that this car uses the internals from BMW. The caveat to that is that there is a really great video that explains it well. Toyota have gone through the engine, torn it completely apart and reinforced areas that do not meet its stress testing criteria. And so theoretically, it's not just a BMW engine. It is a BMW engine that should be more reliable. And having had two, including this one, that have gone and been like, well, we don't really like the way that people have been driving us, so we have issues, that is concerning. There is no doubt that that is concerning. But if we consider these issues to be outliers, because I have joined a couple of Toyota Supra Facebook groups and have not been told that they have experienced the same issues. So taking those as outliers, I really truly believe the Toyota Supra is one of the greatest sports cars that you can get under 100,000 Australian dollars. I'm not saying it's cheap, but it's pretty damn good for a car with this kind of ability. A lot of people say, well, get the Ford Mustang GT. It is the same car, but it's $30,000 cheaper. And that's just not true. Yes, it has very, very similar straight line performance, but it is almost 300 kilograms heavier. Its wheelbase is almost 100 millimeters longer. As a result, it handles like a barge compared to the Toyota Supra. And I know I've driven the Mustang GT, I know. Also, you don't get the same kind of exterior styling, the niche, beautiful looks that make this car look like a supercar. But exterior styling is up to personal preference. And then you go into the interior and you just have a beautiful BMW interior. And while the interior on the Ford Mustang GT is actually pretty good, it's just not as good. Maybe it is with the Android Auto. Let me know what you think. Would you rather have the Toyota Supra or the Mustang GT? Let me know right now down in the comments below. I'm interested to see what you guys think. Maybe I'm very wrong. Even at the full price of 104,000 Australian dollars, I genuinely believe the Toyota Supra is absolutely worth every single cent. And you don't even have to spend that much. You can get a demo with 2,000 kilometers on it for around 85,000 Australian dollars, like fully specced up. That is a bargain. And is the Toyota Supra just a BMW Z4? Absolutely not. My God. Yes, they were co-developed, but they were co-developed in the early stages. They're very, very similar, but there are major differences in the way that they drive, in the way that they handle. And again, I will leave the video down there explaining the partnership and how that worked. It's a really interesting watch and explains it better than I ever could, but no, it's not. But anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you guys think about the Toyota Supra Mark V. Is it a car that you own? Is it a car that you want to own? Is it a car that you hate? Because only the Mark IV is the real Supra. Let me know down in the comments below. If you did enjoy the video, make sure you leave a thumbs up. And again, subscribe so you can see awesome car content just like this. And when I upload the 2021 Supra review a little later. But anyway, thank you very, very much for watching and I'll catch you next time.